Good morning, and to those watching virtually, uh, as well in person, I am Dr. Anton Reese. I continue to serve uh, in this unique role as president of West Kentucky Community Technical College. We're incredibly pleased today uh, as part of our launch of our Black History Month uh, events and activities. Some of you participated, hopefully, in the exhibit uh, through the Paducah Art uh, uh, School. Uh, I'd definitely be checking that out. I was in Frankfurt yesterday. Um, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Chef Donaldson uh, continues to share all of her culinary works uh, as part of the uh, Black History Month celebrations, and certainly more events will be mentioned. Well, I'm here this morning to uh, welcome, actually, um, he doesn't remember me as well, but uh, we met almost 30 years ago. Um, I was a much younger fellow at that point in time, I believe. But uh, we are very, very privileged to have uh, someone as renowned as Dr. William Turner, and certainly his incredible work uh, with blacks uh, coming from uh, uh, Appalachia. Uh, let me just read uh, some excerpts from his bio here. Dr. Turner is the fifth of 10 children, born in 1946 in the coal town of Lynch, Kentucky, in Harlan County. His grandfather's father, four uncles, and older brothers were coal miners. Dr. Turner has spent his professional career studying and working on behalf of marginalized communities, helping them create opportunities in the larger world while not abandoning their important cultural ties. He is best known for his groundbreaking research on African-American communities in Appalachia, but his work is universal. As an academic and a consultant, he has studied economic systems and social structures in the urban South and burgeoning Latino communities in the Southwest. What he strives for is on behalf of all his clients and their communities is what we all want, prosperity, understanding, and respect. With that, I would ask you to give a warm WKCTC welcome to Dr. William Turner. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, is this mic? Yes. All right, thank you so much for coming out this morning. Um, the high school students, uh, in the interest of uh, what we'll call uh, multiculturalism, I want you to greet me in the language that I will greet you, okay? Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Konnichiwa. Let's pretend we're in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, and I'm going to greet you in French. Bonjour. Let's pretend we're in um, Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm going to greet you in Zulu. Hosa. We'll say Hausit. All right. Now let's pretend we're in my homeland in Harlan County, Kentucky. <laughs> I would greet you by saying, how y'all doing this morning? That's all we would say. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, President Reese. Thank y'all very much. Uh, I'm gonna try very quickly to uh, go through a, a recitation, if you will, about this book I wrote recently. Uh, that's part personal, autobiographical, but it's also about just some common experiences. Before we go much further, by the way, uh, the introduction, I want to mention something to you all. Uh, I know it sounded like I'm a real hot shot guy, you know, and I got a doctorate from Notre Dame, and uh, I used to have a, a red 911 Carrera Porsche when I was 40. One time I was standing with some young brothers, and one of them said, man, how much you pay for that car? And I said, I paid 152,000 hours in a library. That's what I paid for that car. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, don't judge a person after the introduction by that person's present situation. As Booker T. Washington once said, it's best to judge somebody, if you must, judge them for how far they had to come to get to where they are. Amen. Uh, that's key. I want to thank that fellow right there. Would you stand up, Mr. Clary? <laughs> Some of y'all know Mr. J.W. Clary. Please, uh... I'm so glad he was able to come out. He's a good friend of mine, uh, the president of the McCracken County NAACP, and an all-around renaissance man. Uh, thank you so much for coming, sir. 
I don't know if Betty came. Is Betty Dotson here? I was disappointed yesterday. I was down at a nice hotel called the 1875 or the 1857 or something like that. Very nice, classical old place. And there were these young brothers working in this restaurant. And I knew exactly where I was looking for. And I said to one of them, this is just part of how I test young people out. And I said, hey, man, look here. I'm trying to find the motel. Is it Metropolitan Hotel? Yes. yes. And this guy said, I've never heard of it. And I say, shame on you. Shame on you. Uh, you ought to know stuff like that. Paducah's favorite son, Clarence Edward Big House Gaines. I met Mr. Gaines many, many years ago when I was on the faculty at Winston-Salem State University in North Carolina, where I lived about 27 years. And uh, Mr. Gaines was a dear friend. I came here at the invitation of Mr. Clary, what, five years ago has it been? Yes. When uh, they unveiled the statute uh, in honor of Mr. Gaines. Big house. Thank you very much. That man was just something. Okay, here's what we're here for today. We're going to talk about history. I don't mind, if you don't mind, I'll come out this way because I can't see that thing. Uh, 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 we're going to talk about the past, times gone by, the good old days, and why history is so important, and why history is probably the only subject that's taught from the first grade through the graduate schools. Uh, and here's how I'm going to do this. I had a teacher at the Lynch Colored School. I attended a school called the Lynch Colored Public School in Lynch, Kentucky. And by the way, don't think about a black person saying the word Lynch. I know it raises some real interesting kind of images. But the president of the company that owned our town was named Thomas Lynch. Simple as that. Uh, you probably read about another man who named his cars after his daughter. Her name was Mercedes. So often these wealthy people name things after themselves. Uh, so, uh, uh, at the Lynch Color School, I earned, learned that in order to do a good lecture or speech, you do three things. You tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> That's the way I hope to do this. Okay, first, in terms of historical experiences, I grew up in a town on the far right here in Harlan County, and we are now out at McCracken County. Uh, it's 397 miles from here to my hometown. And in fact, I started out earlier this week in Harlem, so I came all the way across the state, stopped in Campbellsville the other day. And by the way, uh, another thing about my own background is when I was 18 years old in 1964, uh, I went to a community college. I went to one of the original community colleges of the University of Kentucky. It was called Southeast Community College in Cumberland. Bruce Ayers was a president forever. Bruce and I went to uh, undergraduate school. Good, went to, so I spent my first two years uh, in Harlan County. I was 20 years old before I left home. Uh, so between Harlan County and McCracken County, a uh, where, whereas our town's economic base for coal mining and union carbide came into this part of the country, you might think there's a lot of differences, but you'll be surprised, I hope, with some of the similarities. So I want to start off with a word of caution because I'm going to say some things that if it does not make you go, ooh, why'd he say that? then I don't know why I came. So uh, where I grew up, we were in this mountainous area, and maybe some of you have in your lives driven around parts of the country where you constantly see caution signs that say, watch for fallen rocks. Anybody ever saw those before when you're on the highway? Oh, good. There's a legend to that. There was a, there was a fellow, he was a Cherokee in Bryson City, North Carolina in the 1800s. His name was Falling Rocks. And he went out one day on a deer hunt, and he happened to, upon some rabbit tobacco. Any of y'all know what rabbit tobacco is? Huh? Rabbit tobacco. Oh, I see a man back there shaking his head. <laughs> rabbit tobacco is TCH. It's kind of like the, yeah. Right? See, he, he smoked a little before he came here today. <laughs> we used to smoke rabbit tobacco, believe it or not. Uh, my daddy introduced me to it when I was 13. So this guy got disoriented from smoking this rabbit tobacco. And he got lost. And uh, they waited for months, and falling rocks never showed back up. And to this very day, throughout the South, in addition to all the kudzu, there are these signs that say, watch for falling rocks. Everybody's still looking for falling rocks. I put that as a precautionary note to what I'm about to say, because some of the things I say will amount to hitting you on the head, and it might hurt a little bit, but nothing personal. A word of caution. So first, let me tell you where we're talking about. You see that white area between those blue? That area is called Appalachia, those states. There's 14 states called Appalachian states by a federal agency known as the Appalachian Regional Commission. And the ARC designated, starting way back in 1964, 
uh, this area where all of these black people came into the mountains of the south of West Virginia, southwest, southwestern Virginia, southern West Virginia, and eastern Kentucky, and they migrated there primarily from Alabama, from central Alabama. The biggest coal mining that was done after the Civil War was done in Jefferson County, Alabama, which is Birmingham. The biggest city on the so-called northern end of Appalachia is Pittsburgh. They were both owned by the same company. That company is called the United States Steel. My father worked for the United States Steel for 47 years. He hated the Pittsburgh Steelers. He hated them. He said they pay those boys more to play a darn football game in one day than they pay me in five years. Uh, he, he didn't like them. There's uh, another, another picture you can see, Birmingham, Tupelo. Oh, Elvis Presley is an Appalachian because he was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina, Tri-Cities, Tennessee, Knoxville, Winston-Salem. There's a little place called Appalachia, Virginia, where my father was born about five miles from there. All the way up to my sister-in-law went to an Appalachian college called Vassar in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, Cornell University is in the Appalachian region. So you see the Appalachian region is a strange kind of cut up. Uh, but I'm talking about that part of Appalachia in that dotted circle there, southwest Virginia, southern West Virginia, and eastern Kentucky. And I call it West Kentucky. When you put West Virginia, East Kentucky, and Southwest Virginia, they're all just the same. Uh, I took that picture up there of those four black coal miners. They were the last four black coal miners in Harlan County. I took that picture in 1994. Patsy Tinsley, Ricky Holt, uh, one of those Massey boys, and uh, his name is Ronnie Massey, and Drina Smith. Uh, Octavia runs something here in terms of cultural diversity, which seeks to promote an all-inclusive environment where every individual feels equal and respected. It provides students, faculty, and staff the opportunity to better appreciate the uniqueness of every one of us in here. And that's part of what Black History Month is about. We, we're looking at the United Shades of America. Out of many, one nation. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, about 35 years ago, I helped to write a book called Blacks in Appalachia. Uh, and uh, if you can see him on the right over here is a man named Alex Haley, Mr. Alex Haley. He wrote a wonderful book that I commend to you, all of you students. If you ever want to understand urban black people, read a book called what? The Autobiography of Malcolm X. If you don't read about Malcolm X, you don't know anything about black people in the United States. Period. Yes. I'm not opinionated, by the way. Haven't you noticed that already? Uh, Alex also wrote a book called Roots, 1976. During the bicentennial year, he released Roots. It was the most watched show on television ever. And the subtitle was Saga of an American Family. I worked for Mr. Haley for about 15 years. And when Mr. Haley read my book called The Blacks in Appalachia, I was trying to get tenure, sir. And you know sometimes when you're an African American and you're trying to get tenure, you write the way you think these people sitting in this room want you to write. You might not believe a word of it, but you're trying to get tenure. And I wrote this tenure-getting book, uh, and uh, Alex looked at it and he said, Bill, don't ever write any more crap like this. Nobody's going to read it but some other anthropologists, some historians, some political scientists. Write something your mama will read. That is what I've tried to do since then in this book called The Harlan Renaissance. I told stories uh, rather than did demographic analysis. Why did I do it? I did it because I don't want anybody to come along and say, wonder what happened to the so-and-so people, the Bajan? <laughs> Whatever happened to the people from Jamaica? Whatever happened to these people from Nanny Town? Uh, Whatever happened to these people from a place called uh, uh, Negro Bottom in Johnson City, Tennessee? It wasn't Negro Bottom, by the way, y'all. <laughs> it was the N-word. There was another N word in hazard called N bottom. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. In fact, in certain parts of where I grew up, uh, there was a mountain called N Head Mountain. Yes. In Pennington Gap, Virginia. Anybody ever been to Pennington Gap, Virginia? <laughs> it's over in the Cumberland Gap area. I wrote this book because I didn't want people to ever say whatever happened to those people. And also, I think I wrote it because uh, I have run into undeniable evidence that there are thousands of black people from the mountains of the South who made extreme, extremely positive contributions and achieved a lot despite their upbringing. And finally, I wrote it for my grandchildren. I have four grandchildren, Africa, 
He asked Africa. Boy, y'all should have seen my mama when she first heard us say that baby name is Africa. She said, Africa? I said, yeah, mama, that, my son's name is child, Africa. And she said, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. I, I had an argument with my mama one time about the name of my children. My oldest daughter, who's 52, her name is Keisha Tawala. Keisha Tawala in Swahili means a girl who's going to grow up and become a woman who knows herself. That's, that's neater than my sister. Mama named her Marie Antoinette. Mama don't know jack about the French Revolution. <laughs> she named her child. In fact, not only that, my mama got mad. We named my second child. His name is Jomo Kenyatta. He was the first president of independent Kenya. And my mama said, Jomo what? Jomo Kenyatta. I had been to Kenya. You know, I, I grew up in the 60s when black was beautiful. Man, I had an afro about this big when I was 20. I was into the movement. And we were black as beautiful. It was just like we were surrounded by positivity, and we were transforming the entire world. And we knew we were doing that. Uh, and, and I was a proud devotee to a group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. John Lewis was in SNCC. Stokely Carmichael was in SNCC. We was the so-called militants. A militant was anybody who thought that they were equal to everybody else. <laughs> That's all it was. Uh, so I wrote this because I want young people to know uh, I was blessed to get a superior education. And when you get a superior education, when somebody discriminates against you, which is going to happen to you, when somebody discriminates against you and you have a superior education, it won't bother you psychologically as much because you know it's a moron you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. And so you're going to get stereotyped again. Something's going to happen, but it won't, it won't affect you as much psychologically because you're, you're confident in your own skin. So once again, remember, watch for falling rocks. Any rocks fell on anybody yet? Oh, good. <laughs> Just wait. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk to you from a chapter of my book called Black Folk Done Lost Their Stuff. Okay? My, my grandmother used that phrase when I sat up with her in 19, whenever it was, and we watched the confirmation hearings of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. Now, some of you all may not remember that, but I invite you to go back and you can pull it up on YouTube and listen to the hearings when... In fact, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, was the head of the Senate committee that questioned him. And during that hearing, I'm sitting with my grandmama, who lived to be 104. And Granny listened, and she said, Lord have mercy, these Negroes have gone crazy. You remember some of the stuff? To, she said, they supposed to be the smart ones. Uh, uh, chapter 9 is in my presentation here. Uh, it's called On Trash Talking and Signifying. Do you know what signifying is? We used to say, Brother Clarity, oh, man, he just signifying, just talking trash. We did that a lot where I grew up. I, I bet Brother Clarity did too, didn't you? <laughs> and my last thing I'm talking about in my book is one of the reasons why the status of affairs in African America is the way it is, I think, is that it was from the impact of closing up Paducah Tillman. The way they closed black high schools in the South devastated black communities. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done it. I'm not a Neanderthal. I want us to be under the same canopy as human beings. But they threw all the black stuff from under the canopy. They said, we don't need that anymore. They threw the trophies away. They threw the this away. They threw everything away. They closed the buildings down. I don't know if it happened here, but I think it did. Throughout the South, it eviscerated black communities. And we're still suffering from it. That man right there was my teacher when I was an undergraduate. Uh, John uh, ended up being the president of Berea College. And John was as close to me and my daddy. And uh, when I was getting ready to go to graduate school, uh, what had happened is I went to Dr. King's funeral on April the 8th, 1968. Amen. And uh, I had the pleasure that day of doing something my grandfather used to always say. When you ask Pop at the end of the day, what was your day like in the mind, Papa? And Pop would say, ah, oh, just like looking up the south end of a northbound mule. <laughs> Visualize that. <laughs> At Dr. King's funeral, I had a shovel, and we were shoveling up the mule waste behind that casket. One of the most wonderful days of my life in Atlanta. And in Atlanta that day, in April 1968, I ran to a priest who said, 
are you going to go to graduate school, William? I said, yeah, I'm going to go right over there to the Whitney and Young School of Social Work at Atlanta University. That's where I wanted to go. He said, how would you like to go to Notre Dame? I said, oh, man, they have a real good football team, don't they? That's all I can think of, <laughs> Notre Dame football. Uh, and he said, no, it's a little bit more than that. And so that, that man helped me to go there, and he wanted me to study blacks in Appalachia. And I said, I don't want to study anything about Appalachia, because the fact of the matter is, everything I ever read about Appalachia said this. The whites in the mountains of the south, the Dukes of Hazard. You remember the Dukes of Hazard? Anybody remember Ellie Mae and Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies? Anybody remember Justify, the movie they did? And I hope you read a book called, you saw a movie in 1972, it was called Deliverance. And recently a book was published called Hillbilly Elegy by a guy named J.D. Vance. And it always showed whites in the mountains of the south. Any else begin to whites in the mountains of the south? They basically in Hollywood called them southern crackers. I didn't make that up. That came straight out of Gone with the Wind to kill a mockingbird. They depicted southern whites from the mountains of the south as being illiterate. They depicted them as being feuding, incestuous, fundamentalist, primitive Baptists. They depicted them as gun-toting, moonshining, ornery, semi-literate, toothless people, and they still do. In fact, Jeff Foxworthy, y'all remember him? He got rich making jokes about white people and it was called, You Might Be a Redneck If. Remember that? Yeah. Can you imagine somebody come up with some jokes and say, You might be black if. In fact, whites in the mountains of the South might be the only people you can still make fun of, and nobody would care. And that's why I didn't want to study anything about no Sambo, because all they talked about was Jethro. And so I said, Nah, I don't think I'll do that. But I ended up doing it. So who am I and what I know? That's my father right there, that picture on the left. Uh, my father worked in, this, in the coal mine from the time he was 13 until he was 62. And uh, Dad, uh, on that photograph there, I have a copy of my father's paycheck, December 30th, 1946. I was six months old. Daddy bought home $47.50 after working 83 hours. Yeah, and he, and he had five children. Yeah, Mama, Mama had, in fact, Mama had five children. I was the fifth child. And my oldest sister was just seven years and eight months older than me. Mama had five, and a, five children in just over less than eight years. You're shaking your head. Yeah. Any of y'all from a stair step family like that? Yeah. And then Mama had three more after me. I have three younger brothers. And then not only that, Mama's friend died, and Mama took her children in. And we had a two-bedroom house. Yeah. Uh, my brother's been dead 35 years, and I can still smell his feet because he slept. <laughs> he, he had his feet in mine. Anybody ever sleep with your brother? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, you had to. In fact, there was a, a sheet between the, the boys on the girls' side of the room, and Daddy would put it like this every night. And my children grew up in a situation where they all had bedrooms and bathrooms. I said, y'all got it made. They had it made. They had it made. Uh, uh, in fact, I asked my daddy one time, I said, Dad, look here, bro. I don't want to get personal with you, but how did my mama have five children in eight years? You know what he told me? See that train on that picture? He said, well, Billy, let me tell you, son, that train would come up the holler every morning making all that noise at 5 o'clock. Woo, 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 woo. Clang, 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 clang. He said, wake everybody up. It was too early to get up. <laughs> and it was too late to go back to sleep. Birth control, my father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, we, I don't know if you're from a big family like I was, but it never bought, we never went to bed hungry because our father worked. Amen. I mean, it, you're talking about people who worked, who worked, who worked. And I think he passed it on to us. So that's the name of my book. It's called The Harlan Renaissance. Because back in the 1900s, early 1900s, thousands of black people left the Caribbean, they left Jamaica, they left Trinidad, they left Tobago, they left Antigua, they left Florida, they left South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, and Virginia, and North Carolina, and they moved up the East Coast to New Jack City, the Harlem Renaissance. 
Who can think of the great poets of the Harlem? Who thinks of Marcus Garvey? So few people know about that man. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, and all these black people ended up in what was called the center of black life in America in the 1920s. At the same time, black people moved out of central Alabama into the coal fields of eastern Kentucky, which is why there was a renaissance there as well. So uh, we're here to talk very quickly about history. Uh, uh, history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. History is a compass that people use to find themselves on a map of human geography. When that boy couldn't tell me yesterday where the Hotel Metropolitan was, I said, he don't know what time it is. He don't know where the most well-known on the green book was the Metropolitan Hotel from everybody going up north. Yeah, I see better now. How are you? Uh, history tells people where they have been, what they have been, where they are, and where they are. You just look back at this period we're in on the clock of history right now on February in 2022. This will be marked as one of the most transformative times in terms of American democracy that we've seen since the country was organized. This is a clock ticking right now. We're changing the whole nature of democracy. If you don't think so, uh, you just wake up, old Rip Van Winkle. History tells people where they must go and what they must still be. Hello, can you still hear me? I think I'll hold it like this. Uh, it ain't easy being Black History Month. Y'all remember Kermit the Frog? Does Kermit the Frog still come on? Yeah. So uh, it ain't easy being Black History Month. Why? Because we're in the middle of a cultural war in the United States. That's what it is. There are lots of people who think that the 1619 Project, which came out a few years ago, the basic concepts had to do with white privilege, systemic inequality, and some of the inherent biases in the American political system. And there are people right now that say, buddy, I'm ready to go to civil war if you want to keep talking like that. Don't look at me like that, baby. I'm telling you the truth. That's why I wore a black and white jacket today, because it's almost black and white. You can see it. You can see the patterns emerging in this country in terms of people who are saying, I don't want to hear about slavery anymore. Forget that. That happened to my well. Black History Month, you see that photograph right there? That lady seems to be whitewashing history. She's getting ready to cover up the face of Malcolm X. She's getting ready to cover up the face of Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King. Boy, when they, if, they, if they cover up the face of Martin Luther King, I don't know what we're going to do, because he, he's the only one people seem to like. And the fact that they like him is because they whitewashed him a long time ago. They made him into a Disney character. They roll him out every January 15th and say these nice big words, and they stick him back in that hole the next day like Pox Attorney Fred the Groundhog. Then they put him back out again next year. Anybody see any falling rocks? Okay, I'll keep going. Donald Trump, for example, called it for a ban of the critical race theory. They said, don't even teach it in the schools. I live in Houston, Texas. If you think Kentucky is a red state, work. Texas is Kentucky on steroids. I mean, I live in a state where the governor, governor, I can't, uh, Greg Abbott is his name. We have a senator named Cruz. And we have people who are saying, we're going to turn every state legislature is going to be a red state. And we're going to make these decisions. In fact, it's gotten so bad that the Supreme Court has become a political entity. The Supreme Court is supposed to be objective about things. Some of y'all are getting real tight around the shoulders here, I see. But that's what I meant when I say, in fact, in Kentucky, this man right here, his name is Rice, uh, Wise, Max Wise. Max Wise is a senator from the next door, uh, not too far away, in Campbellsville. And he came up with Senate Bill 138. says, here's what we're going to teach in history in Kentucky schools. If you don't teach this, we're going to fire you. He came up with saying, what teachers can discuss about historical events. You might go to jail bringing these children here to listen to me. Did you know that? Hello? Yeah, they're saying what you, you do remember four months before Adolf Hitler became the head man in Germany, they burned up all the books that were un-German. You remember that? We're talking history here. That's why we must all be very careful as to what is exactly happening in the land that is supposed to be symbolic of democracy. When you get to a place where people are saying you're going to prohibit schools from requiring educators to discuss current events with students. If they have anything to do with race, you cannot discuss it. 
That's what Mr. Max Wise wants to see in Kentucky schools. And if you don't speak up to stop that, uh, as someone once said, may your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth. Because you remember that poem somebody wrote right after, not when the poem, it was a Lutheran pastor who was lamenting what happened in Germany, and he said, they came for the socialist, and I didn't speak up. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up. And then they came for the this group and the that group. And he said, then they came for me. But there was nobody left around to speak up. Thank you, Brother Clary, for speaking up. You have to speak up. James Baldwin, have your teacher introduce y'all to him. He's the smartest man got to put breath in as far as I'm concerned. James Baldwin said, you have to study these concepts because that's what our world is all about. Carter G. Woodson is the one responsible for us being here because he, he, was a, he went to Berea College, graduated in 1903, got a PhD from Harvard in 1916, and then he came up with Black History Month in 19, no, Negro History Week because he wanted to do it in February to celebrate the birthday of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. I stopped the other day in Hodgkinsville. Is that the name of that town where Abraham Lincoln? Yeah. So we need to talk about black history, not this month, but we need to talk about it in terms of world history and U.S. history, because when you leave black people left out, nobody's going to get it right. And then having been left out, this is the essence of what I'm talking about today. I find so many young African Americans who are lost, confused, unsure, unclear, perplexed, disoriented, and bewildered because they have lost touch with the attitudes, the beliefs, the customs, the dances, the jokes, the information, the moves, the legends, the opinions, the prejudices, the soft skills, the superstitions, the techniques, the traditions, and the value orientations of their great grandparents. They don't know anything about it no more. They don't even know their great grandpa's name because we haven't been taught these things. That's my great grand. That's my grandmother. That's the one I told you earlier. Who who watched the Clarence Thomas thing? She said they are disgrace to our race. See, people used to say that, didn't they, brother Clarence? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, you got to you you rep, you represent us, boy. Pull your pants up. <laughs> my grandma used to say, make sure you got on some clean underwear. You might have a car wreck. <laughs> you mean they're gonna think about the whole color people just because I had on some dirty underwear when I had a car wreck and died? Granny wanted you to always be what? At your best. At your best. Whatever happened to your home training? Uh, I, I've even gotten to the place. I stayed in a nice little boutique hotel last night called the 1850s. That's what I told you what? 1857. It's a really nice place. And to this day, I get up and I said, I have to watch this crud from around this tub because they might say, boy, that guy was dirty that was in here. Because Granny taught me, roll the bed back up, baby. Make up your bed. Yeah, I'm 75 years old, wrote, making up the bed in a hotel I paid $150 to stay in. <laughs> but that's Granny's training that don't come out of your head. Any, she used to say, an educated person without any moral scruples is more dangerous than a drug addict with a pistol. If you've got a good education, and if you know it's right, and you have no moral scruples, she would say, I'd rather be around a junkie. Watch for Fallen Rocks. Uh, my grandmother represented a, a generation coming out of slavery. Granny was born in 1895 in Macon, Georgia. And uh, I'm reminded by her every day when I listen to a song. You ever heard of Bill Withers? You young man in a plaid shirt. Open your mouth and talk to me. That's what Granny used to say. Whoa, open your mouth. <laughs> right? Y'all ever remember that song Bill Withers did called Grandma's Hands? He used to play tambourine on Sunday morning, grandma's hands used to issue out a warning. She'd say, Billy, don't you go so fast. Grandma's hands soothed the local unwed mother. Her hands used to ache sometimes and swell, but she would always give you that piece of candy and pick you up when you fell. And she'd say, girl, don't you whip that boy. Anybody remember when your grandmama stopped your mama from doing something to you? <laughs> Because grandmama sprinkle stardust on you. They're the greatest people in the world, grandmamas. And I'm suggesting we've gotten too far away from grandmama. And so uh, how many in here are southern people, when I say black folks, according to my grandma, that lost their stuff, what she was saying is that there's this stuff we got. There's this cultural stuff we had, and we've lost it. This stuff, uh, uh, 
Uh, for example, I'll give you a quick example of material stuff. My wife and I have a nice house. We have an eight foot thing that goes across this mirror that's mine, and then we have a nine foot one go this way with a mirror, and that's her stuff. I bet you got stuff, right? Let me tell you, I can go in our bathroom and get a Q-tip and forget to put the jar back on the Q-tip bottle. Two and a half months later, my wife said, Bill, was you in my stuff? I said, God, she rem how does she remember that? I don't, she knows what, it, her mama, God rest her soul, was the first hoarder I ever met. She has so much stuff, she never threw any of it away. And shortly after marrying my wife, 52 years ago, I never again said to my grandma, Grandma, you need to get rid of some of this stuff. And she would look at me like, now, you might be whoever you are, but you can't tell, this is my stuff. All of us got our stuff. Uh, my teacher knows her stuff. Brother Man Show talks a lot of stuff. Somebody got the stuff beat out of them. Some woman is showing up strutting her stuff. Uh, her grandma told her about that stuff. That's some no good stuff. Now, man, that's some good stuff, and you can take this job and stuff it. So that's what I mean by this stuff. Now, here's what I really mean by stuff. Go read the book, Souls of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois, 1905. Go read about Aretha Franklin. She has some stuff. It was spelled R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. And then there was uh, uh, Alex Haley. The stuff was roots. And the stuff is language and communication and courtesies and rituals and customs and all these things we used to do as a people that made sense to our communities. And we lost it. In fact, I was somewhere the other night, and I played a game. I stopped by the bank on the way to my presentation, and I got five $100 bills out of my bank account. I was in Big Stone Gap, Virginia, and I called these five young black people up, and I handed each one of them a $100 bill like I was a rich man. And I said, tell you what, you can keep the money if you will sing for me the first stanza of the Negro National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing till earth and hell. I got my $500 back. Don't you ever get to the place that you can sing a song by Lil Wayne and you don't know the Negro National Anthem. Just a point of correction. So that's what we had growing up, the stuff we lost, hard working, family first, religion, schooling, neighborliness, patriotism, sense of humor, sense of, wouldn't nobody take you seriously in my hometown if you took yourself too seriously? So who do you think you are? You think you're better than somebody else? Humility, it's part of our lifestyle. Uh, I see people nowadays aren't humble at all. There's a lady right there that knows about critical race theory. She's the one that grandma would tell you Act like you got some common sense. You mean to tell me your daddy never taught you that? Don't you get above your raising? And she would say, Lord, have mercy on you, child. All them, that's like one word, Lord, have mercy. Uh, she was the kind of woman who taught young women how to cook. Uh, quick story. Young lady, we'll say her name was, I don't know, she went to Harvard Law School. And, uh, and she took this young man she met back down to Mayfield, Kentucky to meet her grandmama. And when they got back to New York, the young man said, boy, your mama sure can cook. That was some wonderful German chocolate cake. And so this woman, thinking the way to a man's heart is right through his stomach, she got on the phone immediately and called her grandma and said, Grandma, Grandma, how'd you make that cake? I have to replicate that. And grandma said casually, oh, honey, I just made it from scratch. Amen. Amen. So this highly educated African-American woman, Octavia, she rushed to her nearest whole food store <laughs> and asked the attendant, do you all sell scratch here? A lot of kids don't, they never paid any attention. How did grandmama do that? Everybody, if you're like me, I'm sure, Brother Reese, you remember, your grandmama never had a cookbook. Because she got it from her grandmama, and they just kind of passed that stuff along orally. And you ask her, how much baking soda? Just a pinch. How much is a pinch? You really have to pay attention to figure out what a pinch is. Uh, a pinch of this. It was life lessons in cooking. 
Now, if you look at that picture on the bottom left, you see after people being so socially engineered with programming, they call each other all kind of dirty words and language and thoughts and beliefs and behaviors and habits just been thrown out of the window. And this is what you get. Uh, I bet you a lot of these young people who go to high school here, you know, you, do you have a social influencer? You know, you see people on TV nowadays, their job is they're a social influencer. How in the world do you become a social influencer? What is that? Well, because people are so tied into global media, one of my, what might happen to your brain and your thoughts and your attitudes and your actions, what might happen to your very life, if you're, if the people who are most significant in influencing you, what if they were what my grandmama called bat poop crazy? I'm sorry I said it. You ever heard of that word before? No? <laughs> Did anybody over here, over 50, remember your grandmama saying, that girl is bat poop crazy. She would not use the word <laughs> that I use. Uh, you've heard it, right? Yeah, that means somebody's nuts. And it applies across the board to white Americans, anybody. Thoughts lead to act attitudes and beliefs and actions. It's all tied together. Uh, take those two people right there. Dave Chappelle recently said some things about the LBGT community that was totally out of the box. But he influences a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Trump said once, a few years ago, there are nice people on both sides of that. There's no such thing as nice people on both sides of, of killing people. You can't say that. Amen. You cannot say that. And he influenced a lot of people, people who used to wouldn't even think about some of the things they're thinking about now. It has become normalized. Uh, falling rocks? We okay? All right. <laughs> this guy here, they started singing songs where black Americans are the only people on the entire planet who've been taught through singing and praising their own humiliation. They call each other the B word, the H word, the gangster word, the thug, I'm a dog, I'm a this, I'm a that. You keep telling yourself long enough that that's what you are and you will be, so a woman thinketh, so is she. So many of our young people have begun to degrade and demean themselves and you can oppress them forever because they've been programmed to kill themselves and they won't even understand what they've done. Lil Wayne sang a song where he compared a heinous sexual act to the killing of Emmett Till. And you can talk to the average young person in the street, they don't even know who Emmett Till is. Emmett Till was our George Floyd. Remember? 1956, Emmett Till. So there you are, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, get your face off of Facebook and put your face in a book. Because reality has gotten faked and shaped through social media and none of it is relevant anymore. Just go on black Twitter sometime. You say, no, one of these young black kids are so crazy. Bat poop crazy. <laughs> oh boy. What is this stuff? Where do people get it from? And I'm just saying we have a whole generation in terms of knowing about their history. And the fact of the matter is, going back to one of the things I said about school integration, is that nowadays you cannot expect these students to learn a lot about black people because their teachers know nothing about it. You know, they, I mean, it's just plain and simple. When I went to the Lynch Colored School, all of our teachers went to Kentucky State primarily. They went to Fisk, they went to Wilberforce, they went to Spelman, they went to Hampton. They came out of the same community. When I was growing up, my first grade teacher lived across the street. My third grade teacher lived two doors up. You couldn't get away with nothing. Because one of them tell your mama, and your mama then told everybody else's mama, and everybody on you. Now, teachers get, they teach students, and they don't live around those students. They're not in the Eastern Star and the Corte Caliente. They're not in these NAACP organizations. So there's that kind of split. And so we've, things have been absorbed, we've accommodated in all crazy kind of ways. The assimilation, the adjustments, the adaptations, that's how we lost all that stuff. Look at America now. In fact, one of the biggest problems with our cultural war, we've gotten to a place that somebody's told us to say, your colored neighbors want your stuff. They want to replace you. Uh, we're at war with each other. Don't trust your neighbors. That's gotten to be the essence of America's cultural dynamic. Don't trust each other. And a civilization is built on trust. And we can't trust each other anymore. In that map right there, you'll see another thing about the coming of immigrant groups to the United States. The blue ones say those people who are, come from India, from Mumbai, 
is the fastest growing immigrant group in the United States. I tell my children growing up in Harris County, Texas, you can't grow up in Houston and not speak fluent Spanish. Because Houston is 62% Jose and Lupita. If you can't talk to them, you better go learn how. You can't live in Texas successfully. And it's the same way in Kentucky, too, <laughs> believe it or not. So there you are, I'm about done. Not all black folk. I'm one of those black folk who has not lost his stuff. In fact, I love it the other day. I dropped one of my grandsons. He's 14 off. Uh, I was picking him up at school, and uh, he walked away from his buddy, and he said, I'll see you tomorrow, God willing, the creek don't rise. I said to myself, oh, wow, he getting, he's getting it. He uses Papa's little sayings. You know, they say, I've gotten to the age, I'm like my granddaddy. And now I'm watching my, my sons, my grandsons. And that's what we have to pass on. And a lot of that has not been passed on. Thank you all very much. I'm through. Uh, I've essentially said that God has made of one blood all peoples of the earth. Thank you all very much. Living history is enough. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Quick question or two from the audience. Any questions? I love some questions from 15 year olds. <laughs> Think of one. -old. Yes, sir. A 15 year old back here, Brother Claire. <laughs> Dr. Turner, the question that I want you to, in fact, I've often wondered when I found out about it. What was the setting, and, and to the audience, they asked Dr. Turner to be the interim president of Kentucky, of the University of Kentucky, when it was not even thought of an African American being the president of the college. What, what was that feeling, or, or, or what type of stuff did you actually, stuff did you have to go through? Mm. Well, um... I love stories. There's a story of a man who was, had died, and they were uh, eulogizing him. You know, the preacher was saying this guy was a mason and an elk, and uh, he, uh, he tithed twice what he was required to tithe, and he gave his money to widows and orphans and the NAACP, and that uh, he was just a, a renaissance man. And he went on and on talking about this guy, and it got so overwhelming, the widow sitting there with her daughter next to her nudged her like this and said, baby, go up there and make sure that's your daddy in that casket. Okay? When they asked me about certain jobs that I had been offered, I said, they really don't know who they're asking here. They don't, they don't know who they're asking because uh, no wonder I have not been able to, uh, you know, Brother Reese knows better than I do, when you're in certain kind of jobs like a president of a college, there's certain things you can think of, but you better not say them. And I found myself over the course of my life thinking it and then saying it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and part of that is uh, 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 why I uh, didn't feel at all disappointed when I've been interviewed for you know, senior level positions, uh, knowing I might be as qualified as anybody to get it, but I didn't get it because I did not have the discipline. It takes discipline uh, to say, wait it out, wait it out. Don't get this person on the wrong side of you. And that's what I would say to young people. You know, you have to find a middle ground. And so, yeah, so that, that's where I was coming from in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, for example, when I was, uh, uh, being considered for a job once at the University of Kentucky. Uh, uh, my alma mater, as they say, uh, a gentleman who was at that time a senior vice president said to me, he even touched my collar. I wanted to hit his hand, but I didn't say nothing. He touched my, he said, Bill Turner, I sure hope they don't bring you to the University of Kentucky. You'll, you'll embarrass us. That's what he said to me. 
And then he went on to say, that's because you used to get out here every night and pick at Adolph Rupp's basketball games, and you tried to make Mr. Rupp look like a racist. I said, I didn't make him look like no racist. I used to pick at every one of the games at the University of Kentucky from 1966 to 1968, every Tuesday and Thursday night, because all I was saying is, why doesn't the University of Kentucky have any black basketball players? Amen. Amen. 1964. Well, what is this? What is this all about? And Mr. Adolph Rupp, I met him a couple of times. He, he said, I don't need none of them. That's what he said to me. And so we just started picketing his games. And I remember uh, in 1968, right after Dr. King was killed, I rode from Frankfurt to Scottsville, Kentucky, with a man named Joe Hall, Joe B. He had been Rupp's assistant. And he rode me down here because they were going to recruit Kentucky's first black basketball player, and his name was Jim McDaniels. Me and Joe Hall rode 200 miles. And Jim McDaniels, as you all know, instead chose to go to Western. And the rest is kind of history. And the only reason they, did, they didn't have a good chance to get him is that the basketball coach wouldn't come to recruit him. He sent the, I mean, when you want the number one player in the state, don't, you, don't the head coach supposed to come? Of course. But uh, that's the kind of uh, 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 history uh, that I am so glad in terms of my journey that I decided, uh, uh, I saw a sign on my way up here, a quote from Alban Barclay, where he said, I would rather be a servant of God than sit in the seat of the powerful. I don't know on Jefferson Street, I think I was coming up here. I mean, that's a profound statement. And so I had a lot of trust, a lot of chances to sit in those seats, but people in those seats sometimes, uh, well, let's just put it this way, everybody talking about him ain't going there. <laughs> Grandma used to sing that too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so uh, all I leave young people with is just do your best and try to serve other people. Amen. That's what life is all about. Amen. Yeah. Is serving other people. Okay, any more questions? Did you think of one, Jim? No? <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. God bless you. to share that um, we have two additional Black History Month events coming up. One is on February the 24th um, with the Hipley Ballerinas from Clement, they'll be in the Clemens Fine Arts Center at 7.30. So if you're interested in that, please um, reach out to the Clemens Fine Arts Center for tickets. And then we also have, and I'm sorry, I realized I had this on. Um, we also have the Black History Month documentary that is sponsored by the Student Activities uh, Organization and the SGA. Um, and that will be February the 28th at 11 o'clock. And they'll be showing Tulsa, the fire, um, and the forgotten. And so if you're interested in those, please, be, uh, please join us in those events. And thank you all so very much for coming out today.